Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 205, Game Changers, must-have board game expansions. I'm Sean, your host, and here with me live, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, working with you to make your game nights better. Remember that we record live at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, and you should come join us in the lobby, our chat room. So tonight's all about board game expansions, including our list of must-have board game expansions and some talk about what makes a game, or sorry, makes an expansion must-have to us. That's going to be followed by three board game expansion reviews. These will include Rise of Titans for Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria, then we've got the B-Movie expansion for Roll Camera, followed by another Valeria game, the Winter expansion for Dice Kingdoms of Valeria. Um, then we've got even more expansion play along with some non-expansion play in our weekend review as well. And we'll also be talking about our latest public play event here in Windsor. For links to all of the various games and other things we mentioned during the show, check out our show notes, which you can find at table.bellhop.com slash episode 205. Now, before we get to all this expanding, let's hold, head over to the suggestion box. Welcome to this week's Suggestion Box. Here we share a small selection of feedback we've gotten on our content. Up first, a comment from Mark Spector of Grand Gamers Guild. He writes, Your budgeting episode is tremendous! I'm an expert on budgeting and money management, and I loved everything you had to say. Good work, Mo. Well, thanks, Mark. Uh, glad to hear we did a good job on that topic from an expert, because I will say neither of us are really experts at it but we've been collecting games for a long time and spending money on them for just as long. Now, what was cool about this is I finally actually got to meet Mark, um, actually after he left this comment. He was on his way up to Toronto to the Gathering of Friends, but stopped here in Windsor just to meet up, chat a bit, and pass on copies of his Holiday Hijinx games, which was cool uh, just to see him and meet up. We didn't get to spend a lot of time together. It would have been cool if we could have done lunch or something, but it was neat to just kind of hang out, meet him in person, because we've talked a lot online. So thank you for the comment and for stopping by our beautiful city here. Next up, a few comments on our Hidden Gems game topic from episode 201, Underrated. The Cardboard Kid says, We haven't played many of these, so we'll have to check them out. Some of our favorite less games are lesser-known titles. Perdition's Mouth, Race, Formula 90, Techno Bowl, Three Kingdoms, Fields of Green, Cosmic Frog, Dogs, Kung Fu, just to name a few. Huh? So many wonderful games to share and discover. Well, thanks for the comment, Cardboard Kid. Um, Cardboard Kid's a channel uh, our fans, fans of Tabletop Bell Shop, should check out. It's, to me, it's been really cool to see the kids tasting games evolve as they've gotten older. Um, now, getting back to the comment, what impressed me most about this one, and I'm almost like, did they try? Did they go to Tabletop Bell Shop and come and look and try to find games they never heard of? Because that is a list of games that I have not played. Yes, okay, I do know of a couple. Three Kingdoms, Redux is actually my friend Neil's favorite game, and I've heard lots of great things about Techno Bowl. But none of those are games I played. That is just strange. I often don't see a list, especially that long, when I haven't played anything on it. So those are some games we're definitely going to have to check out. Now, sticking with the same topic, Dave Dawkins says, grab a copy of You Knew, uh, or a.k.a. I You Knew, if you can. <laughs> It's a great little game, but no one knows how to pronounce it, so <laughs> hard to promote. Also, try out Damask, another quicker game with beautiful cards and excellent simple gameplay. Well, thanks for the game suggestions, Dave. Uh, you knew, or whatever, that's how I called it at first, is a perfect example of what we were talking about a couple weeks ago about naming games and how important it is that people can pronounce and spell your game names. You knew happens to be I U N U. And I'm not even sure if you knew is the proper way to pronounce it. And even when I first got the comment, it was a text comment. I thought it was Lunu with an L. So I went searching for Lunu and couldn't find it anywhere. Once I knew it was an I, I could at least find it on Board Game Geek. But again, I'd hate to walk into the CG realm and be like, can you get me a copy of Lunu? And they'd be like, what? I've never heard of it. Yeah, interestingly, uh, I-U-N-U, Yunu, is the name of an Egyptian city and during my okay. research, because I try to actually figure out how to pronounce these things as best I can uh, when possible, when people aren't using strange fantasy names <laughs> that they've made <laughs> up, um, I, I discovered historians saying, we don't know how to pronounce this name. 
this word. And <laughs> and Yunu was the closest pronunciation guide I could find that anyone managed to actually agree on. Fair <laughs> enough. So Shield Seifing has a couple more game suggestions. They wrote Gold West and Hyperborea are wonderful choices for hidden mm -hmm. gems. Hot shots and spirits of the rice patty come to mind. Hey, seriously, tonight, what's up? That that's now three different people recommending games I've never played. I, I guess we've got some work to do. Uh, anyone locally own any of these? I see Roger in the chat's already called out that he owns Cosmic Frogs. So I'm gonna have to get Roger to bring that out at some point. Because I would love to try all of these. And it's not really in my budget to go purchase them all. But if anyone locally has anything off these lists from the Cardboard Kids list to Schultz, I would love to try them out. And thank you for the comment, Schultz. Okay, I've got one more, though this one is more of an FYI that comes from Mark Picklesmere, who writes, The expansion to Hyperborea was just recently re-released a couple of years ago. Really? I was able to get it to go with my copy. Interesting. I, I actually missed that coming back out. That I might have to seek out. Though with this one, it's been so long since I played Hyperborea that I'm going to have to sit down and play Hyperborea so that I can learn to play that again before I throw in the expansion. But I remember spending a long time finding it, searching for it on eBay and trying to find a game good price when I was super into the game. So thanks for the heads up, Mark. Well, thank you everyone for your comments, replies and feedback. Remember, even if we don't read your comment, we do greatly appreciate mm. any and all feedback and conversations that come out of your replies. Though some pronunciation guides would help. That was a <laughs> rough one this week. We've got a couple of things to announce this week. All right, first up, we do have an apology or rather correction to Renegade Game Studios in regards to their game Gunkimono. Now, in the past, we noted a concern about political, cultural, sorry, potential cultural appropriation of the Japanese culture in this game, both in the artwork as well as the theme and the fonts used. And it was pointed out to me the other day on Board Game Geek that that is not actually the case with this game, which is good to hear. Danny Lowe from Renegade wanted to let everyone know by posting, We want to clarify the point about Japanese culture not accurately being represented in the game's creation. It's an easy assumption to make that only non-Asian people had influence over the game. However, this is not the case. Mm -hmm. The graphic designer is Japanese. She uses a Western name and married an American, so her last name is her married name. Her family is still in Japan and her father consulted on design as well. The artist was referred to us by an art expert in Japan while doing research and is trained in traditional wood block printing techniques. Our two partners in Japan both approved of the name, theme, and art game and gameplay and said they would make no changes. A Japanese language expert worked on the name and translations. Overall, many native Japanese saw different aspects of the work during the process. Ultimately, we feel very good about the work and diligence that went into the game and hope this clears up any concerns you have. Yeah, like I said, this is awesome that Renegade actually did their due diligence here, and I do apologize for not doing so ourselves it, to see if someone had already addressed this, because it was an older post by Danny. Now, the next thing we want to officially announce, a little happier, is that we are now officially voting members of the Media and Events Group of Gamma, G-A-M-A. -A. This is something we've been considering since they first added this membership group. We're hoping membership will lead to more collaborations, access to useful information, learning resources to help us improve our content, and a bit of credibility. Now, another benefit of going with this and having this membership is discounted passes to all Gamma shows, which includes Origins. So let me announce right here and now that we will indeed be attending Origins 2023, which is coming up quickly. It starts on Wednesday, June 21st and runs until the 25th. Mm -hmm. We'll be down for the entire event. Now, all three of us will be there, and due to the new membership, we'll also be able to check out things like Gamma exclusive events, including a very cool sounding first look room, early access to the exhibit halls, and more. If we can actually get online, which is sometimes a problem in the Columbus com Conference Hall, we may just be talking about the hottest of the new hotness on social media for a change. If you're also attending, keep an eye out for us, and please feel free to say hi. While I'm sure we are busy, we'll never be too busy to stop and chat with friends and fans. Just please don't be insulted if we don't recognize you or remember your name. I am terrible at names. I really am. It's something I'm constantly aware of and something I always try to work to improve. But this is a con weekend, and we are going to be meeting a lot of people that weekend. 
and it's going to be harder than usual. Plus, some of us deal with crowds better than others. That said, we've got some time before the actual con, and if anyone wants to plan a timed meeting, reach out to Mo on social media or email. Yeah, hit me up on social media with a direct message or email me. You know where it is, mo at tabletopbellhop.com. Well, that's it for the announcements this week. It's time to Ask the Bellhop. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question is, what board game expansions do you consider to be must-have? Expansions you won't play a game without. So this question is often asked on different forums in one form or another. A couple versions in our questions hats that we save up and we pull our questions from every week. Uh, it's been discussed on our Discord, I think, twice now, and it comes up every couple months on social media, and it seems to be a recurring Twitter topic where some pretty heated threads sometimes start rolling on about these. So what makes an expansion must-have? What's our definition? Well, first off, this may be crazy basic, but what is an expansion? Is there a standard definition for what makes something an expansion versus anything else? I would think an expansion would be any piece of content created for a game after the original game's published. Um, while we're not going to get into tonight, I think this would even include fan-made expansions or fan-made content, um, or even player aids could be considered expansion content. I consider promos an expansion, as does Board Game Geek. If you sort by expansion, you get all the promos. Though I will admit, I can't think of any promos that are must-have for any games. Promos, to me, are usually more nights to have, kind of cool. Um, but th to me, it still counts as an expansion. So uh, now, does the, that include for the, the, the shiny stuff? So the, the alchemists, or not the alchemists, the, the, um, uh, the, the cool improvement, improved tokens for... Uh, yeah you know and, and stuff like that, that, I, that I would definitely say yes and well if we read ahead to our list tonight one of them pretty much falls in that category so yeah i would say resource upgrades if they i and to be honest i just thought of an entire aspect of this that we're not going to delve into tonight because i didn't think of it till now but with red meeple ryan in the chat room i think is very pertinent is that some upgraded resource expansions make games more accessible to players and make those expansions must have for people with the issues that require them. Fair it's something enough. I will admit we did not, I didn't think of to dive into, but is, is probably worth talking about a bit that some expansions do make games more accessible. And if a game makes the game more accessible for a player so they can play it when they couldn't, it's definitely a must have expansion for that person. So uh, I think I know the answer to this, but is there a point where it is no longer an expansion? Like, what about these expand alone content where it's, you know, you'd stand alone or it can expand. Uh, a lot of the DC deck builder stuff could be considered yeah. expand alone. That, that one's rough, see, because the same thing goes for like the entire trading card game format basically is built around this, right? Is there a must have Magic the Gathering expansion? I know there's been must have cards over the years. And when is it not just like a new version of a game and when is an expansion? Another example would be the Funkoverse games or something more board game related. They literally call their expansion, well, some of them expand alones, which means they can be used in expansion or combined with others. Um, another example of that would be the Disney Sorcerer's Arena. But for those, you still need the base game. So it's not quite the same as the Funkoverse where literally they're standalone. And another great example of that is Ravensburger's Villainous series all of their villainous series where the, like a lot of people seem to think those three packs are, are expansions, but they're standalone games. You can buy just one of those three packs and play villainous three players, or you could buy two different three packs and have six players and never have to buy the base game. Right. And I, I don't know. I don't know how to classify those. <laughs> yeah. It's I tough. Really like don't. I know I, I always recommend when we're talking about DC deck building, Teen Titans is the go-to starter set you should get uh, rather than the DC deck building starter set. I feel Teen Titans is the, is the better start starting experience right but they bo can both expand each other <laughs> now does the teen titans say expansion on it or does it just say dick dc deck building teen titans uh i think it's like, all do part they of the consider DC it an deck expansion? building uh I, that one i'm not sure i don't think I have to, like an example the board, game list, the board game geek list actually right see what it's listed as because like for example smash up disney we reviewed a few weeks ago um might even be a month ago now sometimes i lose track of time uh, was very much a standalone product, but could be used in expansion. Right. And I wouldn't call that an, it must have expansion for Smash Up because it's not. It's a, it's a standalone game that also expands. 
Yeah, I, I will admit I didn't really dive into that for tonight's list. But I was also sitting here right now, I can't think of an expand alone that's must have. Right. So it doesn't look like be, it looks like all the small box stuff counts as expansions, but the big box but the big box are standalone don't. games. Yeah, see that's that's what I thought for those, but I wasn't sure. Basically, uh-huh. I, I think I I almost want to say the expand alones aren't expansions, and I think for our definition, it has to require the base game. Like, I, I think when you get into must-have expansions, they have to be expansions that require the base game so that you can't play them on their own. They're not standalone. I think, for at least for this list tonight, that's definitely what I went with. Right. What's interesting, though, is something like uh, the DC Deck Building crossover packs, which are expansions. You cannot play the game without them, but those could expand any one of the DC Deck yeah. Building big box yeah. games. So, that's again, it's a, there's some interesting crossover. and, and There uh, is. Uh, the other thing we're not going to get into is is our, our do do um do we like expansions in general? Um, well, we can say I like expansions, but I mean, I I, I don't want to. How valuable are expansions? Should you have expansions? Should games come with expansions? That to me is a whole other topic, other than must have expansions. At this <laughs> point, we assume you're all for picking up board game expansions when they are necessary. So let's get into what we think makes a board game expansion necessary so so what i want to do is i want to take this almost to an extreme to like they have to improve the game obvious right like that's pretty obvious they have to make the game better in some way right but i want to go a step further and say i want to say there must have because i would not play the base game without them ever like if someone specific was like i will only play the base game i'd be like oh can we please include this one expansion like but i only want to play it no no we got to play with the expansion like i'd actually argue it um you know me well enough i'll sit down and play anything so i i, I really i'm i'm saying i won't play the base game but i'm like i'd have to be coerced to play the base game without the expansion so to me i think that's one of the things or at least for the list i put together tonight these these are expansions that i won't play without and interestingly and importantly these are expansions that get taught to new players yes. so the first time you're sitting down and playing the game we're not going to leave this out for you and that's mm-hmm. something that that makes us re- makes something really stand out because it's one thing if okay we're going to teach everyone the base game and then immediately throw in the expansion no 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 these stay in even for the teach yes yeah that's a, that that is my other big qualifier for this to list tonight is would i pull the expansion to teach the game to someone newer would i keep it in there so that is definitely an exp- a part of that. Now, the other one is if I forget there's an expansion, like if it's so seamless that it's just now part of the game, which is also going to include games that have kind of adopted their expansions with later editions. Fair enough. Well, let's start off with the other end of the scale. Uh, since we've broken this list into those two sections, Uh, We'll start off with games that still to this day have standalone expansions that we think are must have starting with. So the first thing that came to mind when looking at doing this topic, and we've been been talking about this topic for a few weeks now, so we've had time to think about this, but the first game that came to mind was Terraforming Mars and the Prelude expansion specifically. Terraforming Mars is one of my favorite games. It's one of my most played games. Um, up until the COVID-19 pandemic, I was playing Terraforming Mars almost on a weekly basis. We were playing that game a lot. The thing with Terraforming Mars, though, is it's long. It is like a five-hour-plus game at times. And you start off so slow. You don't have any resource generation. And until you get cards in play, you can't do a lot. Well, one of the big things Preludes does is gives you some kind of engine at the beginning, some little push that gives you a bit of starting resources and starting way to start generating and building that engine. It's an engine building. So that is a fantastic thing. The other thing though I find is, especially at the start of the game, you are sitting with a hand of 10 cards. And depending on how often you played the game, as long as you played a few times, you're looking at those and you're trying to figure out what the heck to do with them, knowing the vagaries of the giant random deck and what's gonna come up. So you're like, man, what do I do with these? Well. Prelude gives you some direction. So not only do you have your corporations to choose from and go, okay, there's one that's based on steel and there's one that's based on on space cards. Well, you get your Prelude cards and go, oh, wait, I could combine that steel one with this one that's going to get me to place a mine as my first action on the game. 
So that gives me an engine right from the beginning. So it gives you direction. Go, okay, I'm obviously going to bake a game based on paying for things with steel. And there you have a way to go. And actually, I find this great for new players. Because if you haven't played it, that handful of cards, you're like, what do I do with these? I have no idea. You're like, okay, try to find a synergy between those prelude cards and your corp and go with that. And that really helps new players to not be overwhelmed at the start of the game. I remember my first experience with Terraforming Mars before Prelude, uh, and it's daunting. It is not, and you, you really have no idea, and you feel from that start, like you're just going to get crushed by the people around you who are familiar with the game because they're looking at their cards and, and they're shuffling them, and you're rearranging them. You can see them they're working out these strategies and which way they're going to go for the game and, and how they're going to build their engine. And realistically, you don't have any idea. And Prelude just makes that a whole different ball game. Yep. Uh, if, if you think of it like driving, you know, you're driving uh, normally on Terraforming Mars, it's a whole straight road before you get into that, you know, that downhill where you can build up, build up momentum and get your engine going. Uh, and it really takes off a lot of that, that flat road at the start of the game. And that was Terraforming Mars Prelude. All right, the second one on my list is Core Worlds Galactic Orders, the first expansion for Core Worlds, which I think came with as much stuff as the base game. Now, this one I found frustrating. This was the first game I'd ever played that did this as far as I could tell and was obvious about it, was blatant about it. Now, I love Core Worlds, and I still consider it one of my favorite deck builders of all time. But when the original game came out, it was incomplete. The instructions stated as much. You had your cards and there were symbols and the kind of in the middle of the card where your set symbol for magic cards would be. And, and that obviously were different card types and it didn't explain what they were. Even though, and the rules just said, oh no, ignore this, it's for a future expansion. And I was like, what? Well, if there's a future expansion, give me the future expansion. Like, don't, don't make me go buy another product for a complete game. Now, I will admit the game was fine without it. It worked. But every time I played, it felt like something was missing because, well, it was. There was an aspect of the game they cut out. And every time I taught this game to someone, they'd be like, what are these symbols for? And I'd be like, a future expansion. They're like, what? What do you mean a future expansion? I, I, this was a game where they cut out a part to release later. Now, Stronghold Games has explained, and Stephen Bonacore has explained, this wasn't malicious. This wasn't a money grab. This was done to keep the cost of the core game down and more reasonable, because back then, no one was going to spend the $80 it would have cost to put both together. So I kind of get it, but I will admit it was frustrating. Yeah, that's that's rough. I mean, when you're putting that in there, when you're, when you, when you're, you're, you're telling people it's in there, um, it, it doesn't matter whether there's a good reason or not you're yeah. still dangling this this hook in front sure. of them and and not giving them anything which is mm -hmm. essentially going to make them need either need to buy the next product or hate you and not buy your products at yeah. all anymore um, uh, there was a lot of debate on board game geek when this expansion came up absolutely I, it's uh it's a dangerous tool and i mean is it really necessary do you have to have those symbols on there you know if you aren't going to release it don't release anything about it in the original base set so this was a symbol that was literally on every card. Every card fell into a classification, which was explained with Galactic Order. Now I will say, Galactic Orders came out, I got my copy, and it was everything I hoped for and more. It really did complete the game. It also did some cool stuff like providing a bigger box, so everything would fit in one place. So I still think it's really weird that my box says Galactic Orders and not Core Worlds, because it wasn't like a Core Worlds, sure. like you use the expansion box, which was kind of weird. It even had room for future expansions, which thankfully weren't needed to play. The new faction mechanics were cool. They added a lot more player agency over the game and they reduced randomness. It was great. Due to all this, Galactic Orders to me is a must-have expansion. Like, Bornicor's right. It's meant to go with the base game. I will never play Core Worlds without it. And if I teach the game, I don't even bother mentioning it's an expansion. I'm just like, and this board goes out and these symbols, when you play a card, you put a token, spend a token to do a thing. And no one would know which ships come from which expansion, right? I won't play it without. And unless people start talking about buying it, like I'm teaching, I'm like, man, this is really good. How do I get it? I'm like, okay, I'm sorry to say this, but this is actually two boxes in one. You want to pick up this and this. So that's the only time I'll actually bring it up. Now, interestingly, they did put out another expansion. Actually, there's even a solo one. Like, they're still putting content out for this game. This one's still going. But the next expansion, Revolution, I don't feel this one's must-own at all. 
this is one I will actually remove from my set when teaching the game. So it's the opposite of our destiny definition of a must have expansion. To me, it's neat. It adds a new thing. You get leaders and asymmetric abilities. You know, I love asymmetric abilities. So yes, all the power to them, but it's just overly complicated for new players. So galactic someone, orders. Yes. Revolution. No. And as someone who uh, taught, learned uh, core rules from Mo, I had no idea that it was an expansion. I was learning. Yes. That's a good example, actually, because, yeah, when Sean showed up, I was just like, whenever you play a card with these symbols, you, you get a, you go up on this track. Well, it's not a track. It's a pile of tokens. I'm not here to teach you. <laughs> but that was Core World's Galactic Orders. All right. Next up is one that our chat room has already mentioned once, and that is Zaya Embers of a Forsaken Star. This one, I think, is is I don't know. It's funny. It, it amuses me and it's interesting because I love Zaya. I, I played multiple games of Zaya and and had no problem with it. I'm like, this game's highly random. Yes, I can I level up for rolling a 20, I get victory points and I can jump into a sun. Um this th this expansion fixed things I didn't know were problems until I started playing. Yes, I played a game of Zaya where one player took advantage of a short supply run with two planets that were next to each other. And they jumped back and forth a bunch at the beginning of the game and upgraded their ships quicker than everyone else. And they had a huge advantage and they were runaway leader. And yes, they won. But that was all just part of the game to me. It didn't bother me. And then every time I tried to play a space pirate and I'm like, you know how I'm going to do it to this game? I'm going to go for bounties and I'm going to shoot people. And it never really worked out that well. And sure, some of the missions got a little repetitive. But again, it was Zaya to me is an experience game. It's an epic, silly game where you don't know what's going to happen. You're out in space. Who knows? It wasn't until I played with Embers that I realized just how broken some of these things really were in the base game. This is the perfect example of one where I will never go back from. And if someone asked me to play Zaya, they're like, hey, come play Zaya. I'll be like, do you have Embers? I'll be like, no. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll bring my copy next week and we can play because I have no interest in playing it without the balancing factors that this expansion added. Now, in addition to things already mentioned, you also get a new damage type where your ship can get covered in ice, a new home base everyone can use. So everyone has a central location to go back to to repair. Lots of new ship upgrades, solo plays for those who are into that. Neat little comets that circle around planets, lots of new things. I, this, to me, I, I feel this expansion is so necessary to make Zaya great, and it was already good, that I, they need to. Far off games, if they ever reprint Zaya, if they go for whatever they're on, fifth or sixth printing, it needs to have this just put in the box. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I didn't play Zaya before Embers. When I for my first introduction to Zaya was with Embers of Forsaken Star. I think possibly the first time you played it. Uh, I think it was, might have yeah, been. Yeah, it might have been. I'm not sure if it might have been the first time you, you got it out. Um, and, and it was just a fantastic game. Like, this is, the, this is a great game. Uh, and then hearing about some of the earlier play, um, I think a lot of the enjoyment you may have had of that game are, are a little bit rose colored glasses uh, because again, it's, you didn't know any better, but yeah. there's, there's just th that randomness and, you know, you wanted to love this spacefaring game. That's got all this cool stuff, but it's also got all this nasty randomness and mm -hmm. just literally broken mechanics yeah, like, that you were willing to overlook is... at the time yeah. um, until, until you found out that, Oh wow, this is a really great game when yep. we just tweak a few little things and and those tweaks were ember was zaya embers of a forsaken star and in all ferris if you're a heavy euro gamer you may still hate it it's not like it made it a perfect information economic <laughs> game now no it's definitely not Stick to your euro. twilight imperiums all right next one another sci-fi game and that is race for the galaxy and its first expansion gathering storm i love race for the galaxy it is one of my all-time most played games. According to BG Stats, it still is my most played game, even though there's a couple others that are creeping in on it. I have played over 100 games of Race for the Galaxy. Now, I played the original quite a bit. I liked the original. I had fun with it. I showed it off to friends. Found out it's a great two-player game, which actually shocked me, but it was Gathering Storm that made me fall in love with it. All right. As I was saying, I played Race for the Galaxy a lot, um, and I liked it, but Gathering Storm was what made me love it. That's when I fell in love. This is an expansion that feels like it completes the game. Now, for all I know, it's the same as Core Worlds above, like the, that we just talked about. Like the, the expansion is meant to be part of the base game, but they split it off for some reason. And it does feel that way. 
This expansion offers better card balance. Um, the most important part is more cards with keywords, which are needed by some of like the seven cost developments where like you get a power if you have more uplift cards. Well, this added more of those uplift cards and the alien cards and the other keywords. Um, better seven cost developments. Gold tiles. Gold tiles and race are huge for the same reason that we mentioned for Prelude for Terraforming Mars of giving you direction. You start off a game of Race for the Galaxy for a handful of cards with tons of icons on them. You're like, I don't know what to do. Now you can be like, well, at least I'm going to go for that goal or I'm going to try to do these two things. That was extremely useful. Then full rules for solo play. It has the most... I don't know how to describe it. It's complicated. It's not the right word, but involved AI system I've ever seen using flowchart style boards and rolling funky dice to figure out what the AI does every turn. I liked race. I love race with gathering storm. Now, since gathering storm, there were a bunch of expansions that came out of this, but this is the only one I feel that was must have. Now, one thing I learned eventually is that these expansions were released in trilogies. So the first trilogy was Gathering Storms, Rebels vs. Imperium, and Brink of War. And honestly, those are the only expansions I recommend people pick up at all. Anything, anything more than that makes the game feel bloated. And I think some people even think Brink of War started to make it feel a little bloated. And I, I don't disagree. Well, they may, they, they never put out like a buy race with the expansion included. What they have done now, though, is they did bundle those first three expansions. They actually also bundled the second three expansions and the designer now has stated, just pick one of the two boxes to use. So that's kind of interesting that they realized it got bloated by itself. And I got to say your best way to pick it up now would be to pick up that whole trilogy that includes gathering storm instead of buying gathering storm and race. I would buy that trilogy and the original game. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, as fantastic as race for the galaxy is they did sort of drift towards Ascension in the, mm. we have way too many cards. You are never going to be able to shuffle this deck ever. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, and and, oh, you know, and like extra player boards and stuff. Like you'd never played the ones where there was like an alien base where you have to move meeples on in addition to the war track that keeps track of your thing. And then your ability to flip other people's planets over. Like it, it just got, the icons were bad enough. And then they threw in all these little optional rules. Yeah, I mean, anytime you need to split the deck up among multiple people at the table in order to shuffle the, the, <laughs> the main deck, that's a bad sign. That's just, it's a bad sign. But that was Race for the Galaxy Gathering Storm. All right, my next one, our fifth one on the list is the Power Up Expansion for King of Tokyo. Now, if you're looking for a super simple, kid-friendly, dice-rolling Yahtzee King of the Hill game, King of Tokyo is fine. It's a bit, to me, I'd, I'd rather play it than Yahtzee. Yes, you get some nice little power cubes. You get to buy some cards to make it kind of neat. But you'll never see me or even my kids playing with just the original. It's just too basic, too random. And what I hate the most is it doesn't matter which of the cool looking monsters you are. This game needs the power up expansion, which makes it asymmetrical. But like, yes, I know I love asymmetrical, but this one, it just matters, right? Like, it should matter if I pick the Cyber Bunny or if I pick the Godzilla knockoff uh, Gigazor. Like, that should make a difference. With the expansion, now it matters. Every single monster has its own unique deck of cards, which makes them all feel different. And they actually have different play styles. Different ones are meant to be played different ways. And that is just really cool. Now, what I will recommend is definitely pick a power up, but start with one power each and play. Don't wait for someone to roll three health to put one in play. You want that asymmetry right from the beginning. Now, speaking of health, um, hearts, health, whatever you want to call it. The other thing I like is that the fact that this expansion gives you a reason if you roll three hearts, which in the main game, if you're full health, you're like, oh, I rolled a bunch of hearts. Well, now if you roll two hearts, you're like, oh, wait, I might get to level up. So I do like that little bit, too, which does add a fun decision point and a bit of a push your luck element. I was shocked when they put out a second edition of King of Tokyo, which I will admit, I have not tried the new edition of King of Tokyo, but I, I was shocked that Power Up was still a separate expansion, like very shocked. I'm like, come on, like, why, why didn't you just put it in there? It's like, like the expansion box is this big. It's, it's one deck of cards. Yeah, OK, there's a couple tiles and tokens, but it's like it doesn't seem like something where they would have had to pull the expansion out to keep the price point low. Yeah, and it's interesting because. I mean, it's really easy. King of Tokyo is a really, really easy and basic game. Mm -hmm. um, staggeringly so. And, and that one expansion, uh, Power Up, takes it from being a really basic, silly game that's kind of mindless and pointless to an actual hobby game. 
Uh, I think this, you know, and if if you are interested in the hobby game aspect, don't pick up King of Tokyo unless you're picking up Power Up yeah. because it's not a hobby game without it. Frankly. Yeah. Technically, there is a big box now, which I think does include it in all the different variant monsters and promos and pandas and turtles and whatever the heck came out for that game. But that was specifically Power Up for King of Tokyo. All right, next one is Orleans Trade and Intrigue. And Sean will probably agree with me on this one. This one's similar to Zaya because I didn't know what I was missing until I had it. And I really didn't know because people told, kept telling me, and I'm like, nah, I don't need that. I don't need, I don't need that. The game's fine. I love Orleans. It's one of the best games in my collection. I can't remember where it fell on my top 25 list, but I think it was still in the top five. I would have called this an almost perfect game until we played with Trade and Intrigue. Now, the funky bit here, though, is that it's only one part of Trade and Intrigue that I feel is a must-have. One part of it is essential, and that is the Improved Beneficial Deeds Board. And I think the designer knew it because by calling it Improved Beneficial Deeds <laughs> Board, just how much of an impact this had. I will never play Orleans again without that board, even if teaching the game with new players. To the fact that I don't have the original board in my box. I took it out and put it on my shelf with, like, spare cubes and stuff I've upgraded so that I don't accidentally use the wrong one because it might go, you know, a year since I played and I'm like, oh, which board's the good one? No, I only have the one in the box. I, 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 I am going to use this all the time. Now, most of the other modules were may or may not use, as you can read in our review. Like the orders adds pick up and deliver, which I thought was neat, but the end it didn't like. The new pilot play styles, okay, sure, toss those in. Why not, right? The new play styles, more choices. That's cool. The new events are kind of cool. I, like I did like them. They were a little bit more balanced but that beneficial deeds I need in every game. Then there's the intrigue board. We didn't enjoy that one at all. I just leave that in the box. It's technically still there because I bring my game out to public play events and someone might want to play with that. I didn't personally feel the need for one part of it. So you have an expansion here that I still recommend fully pay full price for, buy it just for one piece of it. And maybe you'll enjoy the rest. And what I would say is that while it's not for us, we did not enjoy the intrigue. There are game groups out there that would consider intrigue a must have. Mm. Uh, we know some game groups that would consider that a must have. If your game group likes Take That, are the really aggressive, uh, com competitive players, then you're going to want intrigue in that game because that adds that whole aspect to the game, which is otherwise completely missing. Yes. Um, and so if you want if you want that kind of a game, you don't get it with the game with the Orient until you add in the mm -hmm. intrigue. So I it, it really it's you know, there's a part of it that's an absolute must for everyone, but there are certain game groups that would consider the intrigue a must have portion of that expansion as well. So weirdly you can't use both, which I think is one of my main complaints about it is you use the intrigue board or you use the new beneficial deeds board. If you could use both, I might have liked it more. Well, that is Trade and Intrigue for Orléans. All right, next one is the Rise of Titans for Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria. Now, if you back Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria on Kickstarter, you don't have to worry about this. They did throw it in, which is kind of cool. But similar to Trade and Intrigue, this is another modular expansion where there are parts we liked more than others. So that's why I wanted to follow up Orléans with this. For now, for this one, there are two modules which we'll be using every game going forward. One is take it or leave it. We'll probably use it most games because I don't see why not. And then one we'll probably leave in the box. But I still wouldn't mind using it. It's not intrigue level for me. It's, it's, it's okay. I'll use it maybe. If someone else asked for it, sure. Now, I'm not going to dive in deep into this one because we're going to be reviewing this one later in the show. So what I would say is check out our Rise of Titans review. Uh, stick around if you're here live or check out the segment on YouTube or the review on the blog for more details on this one. Right. And that is uh, Rise, of King, Titans. Rise of the Titans for Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria. Oh, Rise of Titans. Rise Despite of what Tori and Kat want. They <laughs> want it to be Rise of the Titans. I'm like, right. sorry, it's Rise of Titans. She's like, there needs to be a the. The Rise of Titans. Rise of the Titans. Yeah, I agree. They, they don't be a like the name somewhere. Yep, there should be, a, it's just Rise of Titans. Actually, technically, it's Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria colon Rise of Titans, I think is the, the official name of that game. I don't know. Check, check up top. 
later when we review sure, it. It's, it'll it's be right here. Correctly. Correctly. See? <laughs> Battle King is aware, Rise of Titans. <laughs> All right, next up. Um, Sean's going to disagree on me with me on this one. This is the extermination expansion for the 3X board game Horizons uh, because it should be a 4X board game and Deanna and I both feel that you shouldn't release a 4X game without all 4Xs. Now, in addition to adding a fourth X, this also adds a much needed level of player interaction that felt missing from Horizons before that. It was very much multiplayer solitaire with a little bit of a Oh, I got there before you. Ha ha ha. Now I get it. The player interaction in this expansion is mostly negative player interaction. You are doing mean things to other players and damaging them in some ways. So I get that it's not going to be for everyone, but I felt it had its place here. Now I'll admit, I also feel the same way about Twilight Imperium 4th edition, which lasts the exploration. How do you call it Twilight Imperium and call it a 4E when it only has three? But that they first expansion also put it out and I can't really talk to it because I didn't try it with the expansion. But I just like if you're going to put out a 4X game, put all 4Xs in. Now to compromise, because I know it's not for every group, what I would have liked, especially because it's like a small box cheap expansion. It's like one of those like, like, why didn't you just put it in there? It's like, I, I can't remember how many new cards it is, but it's not a lot. Um, I just, you should have had this in the main, main box and just had a variant to use it. That way you got the core game. And if you want more, take that. You want your intrigue in your horizons. You can throw those extra cards in. I just want all my X's in one box. Yeah, no. And this is, this is a fair argument. Uh, again, I did not enjoy that op that module as much, but it does make sense to have it in the game. Uh, the fact of the matter is I don't necessarily love four X games uh, for the, for that fourth X, but there's a reason they exist, and there's a reason there is a term, a 4X game, and releasing a 3X game is kind of odd. <laughs> yeah. So I, I am amused they at least called it extermination. Like, uh, you know, if you're going to add an X, I'm, I, the Twilight Imperium 4 is the first expansion, should be called Exploration, though I know it adds other stuff. And that was Extermination for Horizons. Well, that's it for our must-have standalone expansions. Let's move on to three games with expansions that have been added to the base game in later printings. Honorable, mention, honorable mentions for our list, if you will. Yeah, these ones I originally had mixed in, and then I realized they kind of stand out because I don't even know if you can get the expansions separately anymore. But I did want to call these out in case you do have a copy of the base game, or if you have the base game, never picked up the expansion and don't realize what you're missing out on. So I wanted to point out that these games have been completed and you may want to check out the new versions where you get everything integrated. So the first one, and someone in the chat room has already called this one out for us. It is Kingsburg. Uh, the expansion was called To Forge a Realm. This is to me the best example and the first I thought of when thinking about games where the publisher went, whoa, this should have been in there and then reprinted the game without telling anyone like there's not like includes on the box like no one said anything just ever since the second printing of kingsbird the dice driven worker placement game the contents of forge a realm expansion are just in there they're in the book they're just they're not even separated out as stuff you can use or not use it's just there the game rules include forge the realm forge a realm just as if they were always there which i think is great because kingsbird was just kind of okay until you had monsters to fight like that it needed that extra step of, I'm not just building up my city and my forces and who has the best castle. Now I'm building up my city and my forces and seeing how we do against the hordes that made the game. Yeah, I, I know I haven't actually tried Kingsbird. So this one, this one I can't comment on, but that was Forge a Realm, which is now included in Kingsburg since the second edition. Yeah, and if you played it, you see it with Forge a Realm because it's not like you can get them separate anymore. All right, next up, a game that kind of got mentioned earlier, and that is Eclipse. Um, Rise of the Ancients is the specific ex expansion that I feel completes this game. To me, this is a must-have expansion that now you get as part of the base game because everything from Eclipse Rise of the Ancients has been added to Eclipse Second Dawn for the Galaxy, uh, a rather large box that you can't quite see because it's behind Deanna's chair. Sorry about that. Um, this expansion introduced so many different things. So rare technologies. So you get that rare pull from the technology bag 
where anyone can buy it and does something neat, including like new ship parts and specialized ships. It added new developments. It added more tokens that you flip over while you were exploring. It added rules for alliances. That is something that I'm like, how did you put out a 4X game without the rules for alliance? So I guess alliance isn't an X. But to me, an alliance forming is a big part of those games. And yes, people used to do it. We're like, I'm going to make a deal. We want to attack you. Well, now there was a way to mechanize that. Um, the ancient home worlds, which was just so much neater, where you, when you get to the, the, the bases, the, the enemies have defenses now. Four new factions to play, including the ability to play nine players. A nine-player 4X game, that's massive. When I first got this, I knew I was never taking it out of my box. And then when I sold my copy, I sold it with it, even though Ancients actually eventually went uh, out of print. And people were like, can I just get Rise of the Ancients off you? I'm like, no, these go together. Sorry, the, these, I couldn't even take them apart at this point. They're, they're so integrated with one and another. So that, I, I, again, Sean's played, but you played it after all this was tossed in. So... <laughs> Yeah, and uh, and Ryan's pointing out there that Eclipse had a lot of expansions for what was already a 4X board game. Yeah, there was quite a few, and a lot of it was modular. This was the first big box. They called it the first big box expansion for Eclipse, which is why I felt this one was necessary. There were some other interesting ones, like for one, the ship miniatures, I had a cool nice to have, which is going to be ironic based on our last item to talk about tonight. Um, the, the cool ship minis were kind of cool, but that one I even added in a variant rule for player order that I now use every game, but it wasn't necessary. I just prefer it that way. I know many groups that prefer to go clockwise no matter what, because they're going to do it anyway. And so that to me is not a must have expand. I don't even remember which one that was in. And then there was a later one about like Xenobiology or something. Yeah, Eclipse had a lot of expansions, but of all of them, and I did own all of them at one point and now own them all again, based on what was uh, integrated with the second dawn, um, the, you needed Rise of the Ancients. And again, that was Eclipse. Rise of the Ancients. Okay, my last one's a bit silly, and I've kind of hinted at it a couple times here, but I refuse to play Anachrity with at least one part of an expansion, which was the Exosuit Commander Pack, and that is the plastic mechs, the plastic Exosuit minis that you slide your little wooden worker tokens in. I, I can't see ever playing Anachrony by stacking cardboard tokens and, like, putting them down and things sliding. That would just, oh, it would bother me so much. It wouldn't feel right. It'd be like, you know, have, having processing disorders and, and things being in the wrong order and needing to fix them. It would just be wrong. Um, if anyone asked me to play an Acre without them, I'd be like, I'm going to drive home and get my minis. Okay, because this is wrong. Now, with the original expansion, when it was first published, uh, it actually also gave you two different big expansions. One, the Guardian of the Council, which is another whole set of miniatures that weren't in the base game, a whole new faction that could be used as a, like, third-party faction and was also used in the solo play or you could now use them as a new like choice at the beginning and then the pioneers of new earth modules which added your ability to level up your mecha so there were two things that fit the exosuits i keep calling them mecha but the exosuits so those were pretty cool uh, but i mustn't be the only one who loved the minis because they were included with the base game in the latest kickstarter which included the infinity box and two new expansions and when mine showed up, I got all that with it. Now, interestingly, just before recording, I was on their website. The game now, they pulled them out. So here's an example of, for the Kickstarter and for the Infinity Box, they put them in there like, yeah, it's must have. Everyone's got to have these. I'm like, nah, let's pull it out. And again, I'm, I'm guessing it's mine class trying to keep the cost of what's now called the Anachrony Essentials Box, which is the main box you want to buy now. And the Exosuit Miniature Kit, or Miniature Pack. It's called a Miniature Pack. But that Miniature Pack, unlike the original Exosuit Commander Pack, just has minis. There's no expansion content in it. You just get miniatures. That's it. Um, what they've done with the expansions is they've thrown them in something called the Anachrony Classic Expansion Pack. And I love you Minecraft games, but like I don't even know what to tell people to buy anymore. <laughs> Though thankfully your website was pretty clear if you were totally new on it, but it like, you have to almost like uh, unlearn what you've learned if you go there about anachrony and like just read the page to find out what to buy. So this was a unique one and and because it, it, it didn't include it, put out an expansion. Everyone loved it. So like here, we're going to give it to you. And they're like, no, no, wait, we're going to take it out again. Because <laughs> maybe, maybe there was like they put it out and people weren't buying it at the higher price point. I don't know. But this one's silly. Like it's it's plastic miniatures to put cardboard tokens in. But the game's so much better with it. It just feels wrong without it. 
And that was the Exosuit Commander Pack for Anachrony. Now, that's it for our list of must-have board game expansions. Are there any we missed? What's a game you have that you won't play without one or more expansions? Tell us about it in the comments. Now, we're about to check in with the lobby, but a bit before that, just a re quick reminder that we are here to answer your gaming and game night questions. You can get questions to us by going to tabletopbellhop.com, clicking on Ask the Bellhop. You can fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or message me directly on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Join us for a look at the Rise of Titans expansion for Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria, an expansion featuring four new modules. Now, before we dive into the expansion, just in case you don't know the base game, be sure to check out our Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria review on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com, on YouTube, or as part of episode 196 of the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, Endgame. We also should note that we received a copy of this expansion along with the base game as thanks for the preview we did for the original Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria Kickstarter. So Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria Rise of Titans was designed by Stan Kordonsky, who is the designer of the original game and features the awesome artwork of the Miko, which blends in perfectly with the artwork of the original game. This was published in 2021 as part of the original Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria Kickstarter, but is now available in retail as a separate product. This expansion does not affect the player count of the original, which stays solo to five players, but does make the game a bit longer as the new modules add more decision points and more weight to the game, which can increase player thinking time. This expansion has an MSRP of $25, a reasonable price for what you get in the box. So Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria Rise of Titans presents four expansion modules that can be added to your games of Shadow Kingdoms. There's the Shrine of Titans, where your most powerful troops are resurrected and can be purchased with gold. The Great Battles, where troops from all factions battle together to defeat the Valerian forces. Ancient Spells, which add some new abilities and asymmetry to the game. And Wraith Dice, spectral forces that can be used in any battle, but don't take up room in your army. See everything you get in this expansion in our Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria unboxing video on YouTube. In this video, Mo unboxed everything that came with the Kickstarter, including Rise of Titans. Jump to about 14 minutes in to get to this expansion. So Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria Rise of Titans comes in a much smaller box than the original box, which this, I really dig, is small enough to actually fit in the original box, which is a great way to keep the expansion content separated from the core game, should you choose to do so. In that box, you get a very clear set of rules, a set of five purple Wraith dice, two additional dice in each color from the core game, a punch board with hexagonal tokens in all the player colors, a deck of ancient spells, a deck of oversized cards featuring the great battles, and a two-sided Shrine of the Titans tile. Now the component quality here is excellent with card and cardboard quality totally matching the base game so they don't stick out in any way. Now, I was particularly impressed by how well the Shrine of Titans lines up with the artwork on the base game board. It just looks like it's meant to be there. Now, the only real complaint I could see anyone having with this physically is despite the box being smaller than the base game, it still has a lot of air. Now, I'm sure this was done for shelf presence, but this could have been in a much smaller box than it was. Well, let's move on to giving an overview of how each of these new expansions works and what they add to Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria. So the first module is the Shrine of Titans. This module gives you a new shrine, which is a worker placement spot that is represented by a two-sided tile that gets placed in the center of the board. This becomes a new spot you can send your warden to. Now, unlike the other shrines, no dice are added to the Shrine of the Titans at the beginning of the game or when reseeding the board mid-game. Dice are added to the Shrine of the Titans every time a player completes a battle. Mm -hmm. After each fight, the highest numbered die, instead of being tossed back into the bag, is placed on the Shrine of the Titans. When moving your Warden to this Shrine, you can purchase one, two, or three of the dice there. Now, the Shrine of Titans is two-sided, presenting two different power levels for you to choose from. The difference here is the gold cost, which is lower on one side. With this, your group can decide how much of an impact they want this Shrine to make on their game. Next up are the Great Battles. This is a new deck of oversized cards for the game. You're going to draw two of these at the start of the game, and a new one is drawn whenever a 
great battle is completed. Now, each of these cards lists two army types, and then it has five spots to place troop dice. Similar to the Shrine of the Titans, this module has you do something with your dice after battle. In this case, though, it's your lowest die of the appropriate troop type that is sent to the battle of your choice. That is, if you have any of the applicable mm -hmm. troop types. Each troop you send will get you an instant reward, and you get to place a new hexagonal token in your faction color onto the battle card for when it is full. Now, once a great battle card is full of dice, the battle happens and it scores. You're going to total up the strength of all the dice from all the players on the card and reference a scoring card to see how many points each player who took part gets. Now, this score is actually multiplied by the number of tokens and then dice each player contributed. The scoring card for the great battles is two-sided. One side takes more strength to score points than the other, so your group can modify how much impact this expansion will have on your games. Next, we have the Ancient Spells. The start of the game, each player is dealt three ancient spell cards. Each of these lists two of eight different spells on it. At any point during a player's turn, they can play a spell by discarding the card and picking one of the two spells on it to take effect. These spells feature a range of effects, including increasing the strength of your troops, gaining gold and magic for re-rolling one of your troops, getting gold for discarding an instant action champion, creating gems for gold and magic, and more. Now, the final module in Rise of the Titans for Shadow Kings of Valeria is the Wraith Dice. This set of five new purple dice are tossed into the bag at the beginning of the game. They come out onto the board just like the other dice, either at the beginning or while restocking the board. Unlike the normal dice, these dice don't have a troop type. Instead, they are counted as wild and can be used for any type. Mm -hmm. Wraiths, also being incorporeal, don't take up a slot on your board when drafted, but they are hard to control, so you can only have one wraith die at a time. Now, the disadvantage of these wraiths is that they aren't very strong. These dice only feature values ranging from 1 to 3. While this hurts during battle, it does make them good for drafting for discounts. So now that you know what the four modules in Rise of Titans are, and you have a good idea of how to include them in your games, Let's dive into our thoughts on each of them. So we found each module to be interesting, and all of them gave you something new to consider while playing Shadow Kings of Laria without really changing the feel of the game. We enjoyed each of the modules and didn't find any we would never use, which is a good thing. That being said, the impact they had and the value they add to the game is certainly debatable and not consistent across mm -hmm. all four modules. Now, for me, at this point, if I'm the one setting up the game, there are two of these modules I would use every time. One I may or may not toss in, and one I would probably leave in the box. As just said, though, if someone wanted to use the Force module, I wouldn't say no. It's not terrible. I just probably wouldn't use it in most of the games I set up. They aren't bad. You just have to weigh their benefit against the additional time and complexity added to the game to see if, for your group, each one will be a keeper or not. Now, the first module I would use in every game is the Great Battles. I really like the impact these had on the game. One of the things we found with the original game is that it can start to feel somewhat samey after a number of plays. Now, my favorite part of this module is that it gives you a new way to score points. Along with that, it also gives you a potential reason to use lowered numbered dice in battle just so you can get them over to a Great Battle. We also found that this module encouraged players to complete battles more quickly with players completing battles with lower troop requirements, just so they could get in on a soon-to-end great battle, instead of holding out to do a battle on their own with a bigger troop type. I also kind of like the thematic aspect of different factions contributing to a large battle that's also going on while everyone's doing their own battle plans. I just kind of like the, the metagame of that. This also adds another level of player interaction to a game that can have a bit of a multiplayer solitaire feel at time. This is something where players are directly interacting with each other on the separate cards. Also amusing how you're sending your weakest little slugs over to help everyone else in the battle. That's true. Uh, now, I really enjoyed how it added more thought as how many battles you or others had completed and what the current power was up to could influence your choice of where to add your troops or even when to have a battle or which battle to engage in, trying not to give too many points to your opponents who are sharing the value of those battles with you. 
Now, due to how much we like th how this one impacts the game, we usually choose to play it with the lower strength side of the point card. We did try both. But having it at the lower point means the great battles are more th worth taking part in than on the other side, and we like that additional impact. I think making them less valuable simply prices them back out of the game. With the lower cost side, they're thought-provoking and impactful, and at the higher price, they become a bit extraneous again. Now, the next module I'll be using in every Shadow Kingdoms Valeria game is the Shrine of the Titans. The big thing this module adds is randomness mitigation. Having this shrine in play means the high-value dice remain in play after a battle, and so they can be drafted by other players, or if players let them sit there, even by the players who used them in the original way. This can really help out everyone when the board is filled with low-value dice especially since many players will up the value of these dice just before Battle of Magic and Gems. So you draft a low-cost one, you pump it up, and then it ends up going to the Shrine where it's now available for someone else. Interestingly, in one play, we found it could act as a distraction, <laughs> with the player overly focusing on it to their detriment, as the big dice aren't always the best choice. Now, I also like the fact this new board section gives players another option. This is another way to spend gold. This is another place to put your... Um, your warden when moving around the board. We've had some games of Shadow Kingdoms where players have more gold than they know what to do with, and it's nice to have a new spot to spend it. Just don't waste all your cash there or you might regret it later. Now, I particularly liked using these two modules together, the Shrine of Titans along with the Great Battles. There's just something about your troops going on to be used in additional ways after a battle that feels good, even if it may not be you that gets to rehire a troop that's resurrected. Using these two modules together also reduces the randomness of the dice draw during a refresh. And this was something you don't really get the first time you use it, but you start to notice that when you're refilling the board, while well, these dice are still out, so they're kind of locked into play and they're still going to be there. So I thought that was pretty interesting change to the probabilities of the dice bag. It definitely made battles feel much more impactful and fulfilling as a player to see your dice do one thing and then go on to continue being of value. Hmm. Though, of course, again, as Mo said, it potentially reduces the dice available in the next die pull. Now, speaking of dice, my next module of choice from Rise of Titans would be the Wraith dice. We thought these purple dice were, were pretty cool. Um, they're, they're great at reducing the randomness of troop colors, which will help players be able to complete battles earlier. Um, when players haven't unlocked things, like every faction has an ability that lets them use their color as a wild card, well, until then, you could have a board where there's no brown dice to draft, while well, Wraith will fill that spot. I also dig the fact they're low-powered dice, which is great for getting discounts, but don't make a huge difference in battle. So yes, you grab that one Wraith um, to get six gold if it's on that particular shrine, but then it's only a one in battle. I kind of like the balance of that. So it is possible that that one to three strength might be the amount you need to push to a higher scoring category because once someone played this game even once, we'll realize it's all about hitting different thresholds. I didn't see their value at first, and I still don't love them, but that's why they're at number three on our list here. I did, by the end of the game, see the benefit of them and grew to appreciate them more, but they would definitely never make a must-have list for me. And this is one I would definitely keep out, I think, when introducing the game for new players. I just think it's an extra level of complexity. Now, while I can't pick out a specific aspect of the Wraith dice I don't like, I just, I have to take or leave them. Like, they're a fine addition, but I don't feel like they were missing either, because we played a game on the weekend that didn't use them at all. Yeah, exactly. They're nice, but perhaps some players might really adapt well to them and thrive with their addition. Now, of course, the final module in Rise of Titans for Shadow Kingdoms is my least favorite, and that is the Ancient Spells, which is ironic. If you have read or listened to our Shadow Kingdoms of Lyria, my biggest complaint about the game is its lack of asymmetry, and that's what this expansion was meant to add. But it's just not the right kind of asymmetry. I wanted each of the five factions in the game to feel different, and that's not what these spells do. Instead, they give every player six new ways to break the rules and earn some stuff during the game. It's not tied to the faction they're playing at all. And where this really fell down was the fact those six new ways are only out of a total possible version of eight different spells. Yeah, sadly, this did not achieve what we believe they were trying to achieve with this edition. While the powers were nice and helpful, they just didn't stand out, and the lack of variety, especially in five-player games, mm. was very disappointing. 
Yeah, every time I've used this module, my hand has consisted of at maximum four different spells and lots of duplication. Like one time I could cast the same spell three different ways on three different cards. Everyone else's hand is kind of the same. And there's always an overlap of what spells you have with the other players. I think the biggest problem with this one is only having eight spell types ends up not feeling at all asymmetric. Yeah, this deck needs, for me, a significant expansion for it to achieve its goals. Right now, it's just not worth the time involved in adding them to the game, both in decision time, setup, and teaching. Yeah, I just, I wanted more out of these. I don't feel they really add much to the game, and the fact everyone gets them kind of made the effect kind of feel like a wash, like we're all getting the same benefit. I tend to leave these in the box when playing Shadow Kings of Larry. That said, if someone said, hey, I like the spells, toss them in, sure, I'll play with them. Again, it becomes a cost-benefit analysis, and these just fall a little short. Now, overall, I think Rise of Titans is an excellent expansion for Shadow Kings of Lyric. Unlike some other module-based expansions, we ended up liking all four of the modules presented here. Now, of those four, there were two we really enjoyed, and we'll be using pretty much every game. The Great Battles and Shrine of Titans, specifically. There's one we may or may not use, which is the Wraith Dice, and one we'll probably keep in the box, which is the Ancient Spells. With this, the impact of those first two modules have on the game, to me, pushes this expansion into that must-have for all Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria players category. Just barely, though, barely. Like, I've been debating it since playing the expansion a couple times. The, the reason I say this is I will still happily play the base game without modules. And yeah, it might feel like I'm missing a bit, but like, it, these, this expansion doesn't fix anything. And, and the base game is still a great dice drafting engine building worker place game. The expansion doesn't fix it, but it does make it better and better enough that I think it's worth picking up for any group who enjoys the original. If you've been looking for the player asymmetry we've always wanted this game to get, this isn't going no. to fulfill that hunger. However, I think, and I think we both agree, that it does increase the replayability mm -hmm. of the game which yes. got a little tired on our table for a while, uh, after a while. Yeah, that game can start to feel samey, and this does help with that significantly. Well, that's it for our review of Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria, R Rise of Titans, an, exp uh, an expansion we strongly <laughs> recommend any Shadow Kingdoms owners to pick up. What's an expansion you think that, sh that everyone that owns the base game should pick up? Tell us about it in the comments below. If you have thoughts on this review or must have expansions in general, I invite you to join the Tabletop Bellhop Discord, which you can find at discord.tabletopbellhop.com. Welcome to a review of the B Movie expansion for the cooperative movie making board game Roll Camera. Since this expansion does require a copy of Roll Camera, you might want to pause here and check out our Roll Camera review over on the blog, on YouTube, or as part of episode 152 of the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, The Games of Ah Shucks. We also want to thank Grand Gamers Guild for getting us a review copy of this expansion. So the B-movie expansion for Roll Camera was designed by Malachi Ray Rampant, the original designer of Roll Camera and John Velgus, who is best known for Finger Guns at High Noon. Features artwork by Malachi that perfectly matches the style and silliness of the original, which makes sense because he's a comic book artist, web comic artist. Now, the player count stays the same at one to six players, but the game time does get a bit longer as the new genre mechanics add a significant amount of new things to the game for players to deal with and provides a broader decision space, leading to longer games. The B-Movie expansion was originally funded through Kickstarter and was published here in North America in a joint effort between Keen Bean Studio and Grand Gamers Guild. The retail version, which is what we're reviewing here today, has an MSRP of $30, which may seem high for an expansion until you see just how much stuff yes. comes in this box. So the big thing the B-Movie expansion adds to Roll Camera is a new genre system, which includes the genres of Western, sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and crime. Now, this comes out in play through genre tokens, new middle script cards, and ways to manipulate both. To win the game, now, not only does your movie have to be good enough, or bad enough, it also has to fit the right genre. The box also includes six new rolls, a ton of new screen cards, scene cards, equipment cards featuring powerful one-time abilities, 
more problems, more ideas, new top and bottom scripts, new production companies, stickers and tiles, and other bonus items. For a look at all of this stuff, be sure to check out our Roll Camera, the B-Movie Expansion unboxing video on YouTube. It really is a lot of stuff. Yeah, this is one small but heavy box that has a lot of well-packed stuff in it. Of note is the very clear linen finish rule book with a cool VHS theme. This is one of the most pleasing rule books I've ever touched. Super thick two millimeter cardboard tokens, sturdy two sided player boards and a ton of cards. Most surprising to me was just how many new scenes you get with the expansion. This box contains three times as many scenes as were included in the base game and doubles the number of player roles. Quality here is excellent, and I'm very pleased to say that everything in the expansion will actually fit in the base game's game trays insert, though it is a bit tight. So how do you use all this new stuff? What exactly does the B-Movie expansion add to Roll Camera? So the big thing this adds to Roll Camera is the genre system that I just mentioned. This is a totally new layer to the game, and most of what comes in this box is there to support this new way of play. When playing with genres, there are a number of changes to the game. The first of which is the fact that the script section of the board now contains three parts. Top and bottom scripts as before, plus the new middle script cards. Each of these features six genre icons made up of Western, sci-fi, fantasy, crime, and horror. Now, mechanically, these new middle script cards become a new requirement that must be met in order to win the game. Your finished movie must include, at a minimum, six genre tokens matching the current middle script card at the end of the game. If they don't, you lose. This new script card counts as a script card for all in-game purposes and can be modified, changed, and affected by all in-game events that previously only affected top and bottom scripts. To go along with these new genre requirements, the new scene cards include one or two genre symbols on them. When those scripts come up on the storyboard, you place the appropriate genre tokens on them. In addition to the genre tokens, some of the new scene cards also include more than one theme and count as having both themes shown for all interactions. Now, interestingly, at the start of the game, you shuffle all 100 scene cards and draw only 25 to use, which could be a mix of the new and old cards. And due to the fact you may not get the right type of scene cards, or the right genre tokens, there are now two new worker placement spots added to the board when playing with genres. One of these action spots lets you swap out a genre token for $1 or add a new one to a scene for free. The other lets you wipe the entire storyboard, drawing a new set of four cards using a pair of dice. The next addition to the game is that the, the B-Movie expansion adds our equipment cards. You draw three of these at the start of the game, place them near the board. Each of these features a new action spot with a very powerful ability that can only be used once. At the end of the turn, when an equipment card's been used, you take the die off, pass it to the next player, and flip it over so it won't be used again. The rest of this expansion includes new idea and problem cards that are shuffled into their respective decks, new top and bottom scene cards to be mixed in with the originals, and new production companies you can choose from at the start of the game to make the game more difficult and interesting. Now, while it's obvious that the designer and publisher expect you to add all of this to your base copy of Roll Camera and use it every game, there are parts of this expansion that can be used without having to play with the genre system. This includes the new player roles, some of the new equipment cards, and most, if not all, of the new script cards. There's one final bonus item included with the B-Movie expansion for Roll Camera, and that's a small punch board filled with small silly icons that can be punched out and placed onto your completed scene cards. These serve no in-game purpose, but are fun to play with. Now, as you just heard, the B-Movie expansion adds a lot of stuff, right? Physically, a lot of physical stuff to roll camera. There are more cards in this expansion than were included in the base game. That counts every type of deck. It's ridiculous, which I found to be very impressive. Equally impressive is the quality of the new components, especially the thickness of the cardboard tokens. We were happy with the original game material quality, and as one would hope, the new material doesn't disappoint in the least. Oh. I was also very happy to see the game included both tiles and stickers for the new action spots and for the larger script area. I like having the option to permanently change my roll camera board if I want to or not.
Uh, this is an interesting inclusion, as while the ability to change back and forth is nice, there is enough material to make pulling out all the expansion content impacted by the genre system a bit of an effort. Yeah. So I doubt many people will choose not to keep it in after trying it. And the most shocking thing to me with this expansion was the fact that it all actually fit in the aim insert. It was already pretty tight fit. Like it looks like a movie reel. It's kind of neat. But we ended up having to mix up stacks of cards and different types and the tokens were kind of placed all over the place. It did fit and the lid shut. I will say though, it's not the most optimal method of storage for getting the game set up at the start of game night though. I honestly didn't think it had a chance of fitting when looking at it. Even after getting halfway put away, it was still looking unlikely, but it did work and hats off to them for that. Now, as for gameplay, I liked what the B-Movie expansion adds to roll camera. The new genre mechanics fit in well with the theme of the game. I especially like how integrated into the core loop of play genre becomes once you add in everything. It isn't just a new requirement. It's something you have to manage, something you can manipulate. It comes up during idea sharing, and genre-based problems come up frequently. What it didn't add, thankfully, was additional frustration. While the game isn't easy and there's a lot to manage, adding in the genres didn't overwhelm the game thanks to the additional ways to mitigate them as a problem. You can't ignore them, but they are problems that can be solved with enough time and money. Now, another big thing this expansion does for old camera is adds variability to each game and through that replayability. While part of that comes from the new production company cards, it's mainly derived by the sheer amount of new cards that get added to the game. The fact you only use five of each script section and 25 of 100 scenarios each game means that no two games of roll camera should ever be the same. Doubling the number of available roles only adds to this. Honestly, this is what's truly staggering about the game. Even ignoring the genre system, the amount of new content added means you can play this game many times without ever worrying about it getting stale. Even just trying it once as each different roll means the cost per play of this game mm -hmm. and expansion is shockingly low. Well, it is possible to pick up this expansion and ignore the new genre system. I can't see you wanting to do this. With the B-movie expansion for roll camera, I say you are either all in or you aren't. While there are a few things in this box not tied to the new system, the vast majority of it is all designed to work together central around this new mechanic. I would say at the very least, get it all in there for your first play or first few plays. I think you'll decide it's more than worth keeping in. Now, amusingly, one of my favorite parts of this expansion is the fact the genre tokens were designed and sized in such a way that they're designed to be placed onto your completed scene cards once they're flipped over. And I've got to say, adding cowboy hats and robot heads over top of Malachi's artwork is more fun than it should be. And so far, everyone has loved the fact that we got a bunch of silly bonus icons to make the scenes even more interesting. Again, as a cooperative game, there's so much to it that allows you different ways to have fun and these new tokens and otherwise pointless punch outs are another feature like <laughs> the optional rules on each player role that just allow you to have fun with it i was very tempted to yell stop in the middle of that sentence but <laughs> that'd be a bit of an inside joke from our game night yeah <laughs> we've enjoyed every game of roll camera we played uh with the b-movie expansion honestly without the b-movie expansion and at this point i can't see bothering to ever pull this out of my copy that said I, I wouldn't say this is a must-have. The B-movie expansion didn't add anything to roll camera that felt like it fixed a problem with the base game. There was also nothing here that felt like it was missing. They didn't feel like the original game needed themes, now or genres, now it does. Yeah, we enjoyed all the new stuff. And I have to admit, the replayability in this game is now at ridiculous levels. But there was already tons of replayability in the base game based on this small subset of cards you used and the huge amount of production companies to choose from. The new genre system is highly thematic, and it just feels right at home with the rest of the game, but it doesn't feel necessary. Overall, the B-movie expansion for roll camera is a nice to have. This is a cool expansion. It expands on a fun game and adds some neat new elements that fit in great both thematically and mechanically. I'm glad I own it, and I can't ever see playing roll camera without it. If you own Roll Camera, you will probably want to pick up the B-Movie expansion at some point, 
Mm -hmm. Except for the fact that it may go out of print, there's really no rush, though. Enjoy the base game until it starts to feel a bit samey, then pick this new, up this new way to add a whole new level to the game and make it feel fresh again. Now, if your group loves Roll Cam Run, you play it all the time, and you can beat it on the highest difficulty, and you've tried most, if not all, of the original production companies, then go for it. Pick up the B-Movie expansion and enjoy everything it has to add. For groups new to Roll Camera, or for people who have maybe played at a con or a friend's copy and are looking to pick up their own copy of the game, I would recommend checking out the Roll Camera Premium Bundle. This includes not only the base game and this expansion, but some cool upgrades like better dice and wooden genre tokens. Now, if you or your group didn't enjoy Roll Camera, there's no reason to pick up this expansion. This is not the kind of expansion that completely changes the base game or fixes problems with it. I can't see someone who didn't enjoy the original being won over in any way by anything included in this box. Now, finally, for those that do have roll camera and think this expansion sounds pretty cool but finds the cost a bit high, you can get a print and play version for only 15 bucks. That's all we have to say about the B-Movie expansion for Roll Camera, the cooperative movie-making board game. A nice-to-have expansion, but not one we felt was a must-buy in order to fully enjoy Roll Camera. <laughs> What's a board game expansion you like, but didn't feel is really necessary? Fun to have and play with, but you don't tell everyone else that owns the base game to rush out and get it. Let us know in the comments below. I also invite you to check out my written review of the B-Movie expansion for Roll Camera over at the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. And if you enjoyed this segment, please consider tipping your bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Welcome to our review of the winter expansion for Dice Kingdoms of Valeria. Now, before we get going, I want to make sure you read, watched, or heard our Dice Kingdoms of Valeria review, either on the blog, YouTube, or on episode 198 of our podcast, Oddball Games. Feel free to pause and go check it out. We'll still be here when you get back. We also have to thank Daily Magic Games for sending us review copies of the base game and this expansion. So the Dice Kingdoms of Valeria Winter expansion was designed by Levi Moat, who's also the man behind the original, and it features the Miko's artwork yet again. The player count, playing time, and recommended age doesn't change with this expansion, though I would say the weight is just a touch higher. The expansion has an MSRP of $15 USD. The winter expansion for Dice Kingdoms of Valeria provides you with two new pads of sheets that you use instead of the ones in the original box. These feature a winter theme and snow-covered artwork. Changes on these sheets include different guild-building effects in different orders, a completely revised road system, and monsters whose dens have to be discovered before they can be attacked. For a look at these new sheets and how they are packaged, check out our Dice Kingdoms of Valeria winter expansion unboxing video on YouTube. There's really not a lot to say here. Um, these sheets are more sheets. They're the exact same quality of the original. You get just as many, 50 of each side, and they have the same bleed issue that the originals do. They're also very dark, but we'll get into that when sharing our thoughts. Using Dice Kingdoms of Valeria Winter Expansion couldn't be easier. When handing out sheets at the start of the game, hand out one of each winter sheet instead of the originals. That's it. In general, these sheets work exactly the same as the base sheets, with only one exception. In this version of Dice Kingdoms of Valeria, the monsters are holed up in their layers for the winter and can't be attacked until you control the domains connected to them. At the start of the game, only the smallest group of enemies can be attacked. All other monster groups can't be attacked until you build roads to the appropriate domains that connect to them. All of the rest of the rules for Dice Kingdoms of Valeria apply as normal, and these sheets can also be used for solo play. Do note, though, that there are more changes than just the roadmap. What you unlock when and how much of each has changed for each guild as well. Now, the best part about the Winter Expansion for Dice Kingdoms is that it changes things up just a bit, but not enough that it changes the overall feel of the game. Still feels like you're playing Dice Kingdoms. For fans of the game, this expansion just gives you more of what you love. Initially, I was hesitant as to what sort of value this could possibly have as at a quick glance, it's more or less similar. Yep. Now, despite feeling familiar, though, it does feel exactly the same. It does feel a little different. And I think this is mainly driven by two changes that have that impact. Now, one's obvious. 
the new rules for attacking monsters. This does have a pretty significant impact on play, which drives not only fiercer competition for the low-cost monsters, but also more player interaction as players are going to want to watch to see what other monsters other players can reach and what they might be working towards. The new monster system also seems to reduce the number of red dice used by players in general, which then again leads to less coins, which leads to less statues in play by the end of the game. This has led our games to have less deviation in final scores by the end, which is something I actually personally like. If you don't do much attacking already, though, it may not have as much of an impact on your game. True. The other significant change is the roads themselves, um, particularly what you can reach at the beginning. Instead, you're starting in the two corners. Now, with the base game, it is very easy to get to all the various die modifiers very early in the game. They're only two or three pips away from the starting points. With the inventory expansion, it takes a lot more uses of green dice to unlock these, and I've yet to see a game where someone has unlocked every possible die modifier. What this ends up meaning is that you start off with no randomness mitigation through player powers and only unlock them later in the game, and you'll probably never unlock all of them. I actually kind of like the feel of this because it feels more like you're gaining more control over your destiny as the game goes on. I also don't feel it gets too random, which is the, the scary part of this, because you still have three dice to choose from when picking which actions to take, and that whole blue magic die that you can add to one of them. Now, I found this as less of a change than the monsters, but my own style tended just to be to work with what I got, and I didn't modify my dice as much as I probably should have. Yeah, that is something that's definitely easy to, to forget with or without the expansion. Use those dice modifiers. Now, these are the big changes. Along with these, there are some less impactful but still important guild power order changes that just, I don't know, make it feel more interesting and fresh. It just kind of feels different. I would say they're slightly more complicated and the game is slightly more difficult overall. And since playing with it, all of our scores have tended to be on the lower end when compared to the original, which is slightly disappointing just in the fact that I don't think you could combine the two sets. Though I would be tempted to mix and match a sheet from each to see how that works, but I think you want all players to be using the exact same set. Yeah, absolutely. There's one big issue with these new sheets, which I think is important to note. This new artwork is very dark. Mm -hmm. And this has resulted in the paths to the monsters being almost impossible to see. Yeah. It feels like the contrast is wrong on printing. Now, along with this, there's one particular plume of smoke that once you figure out where the paths are, looks like another path. <laughs> uh, and every single time we played the game with someone for the first time, they have misunderstood what reaches what. Yeah, I, I like you said, it might be a printing error. I don't understand why this isn't more clear. Plus, it's snow covered. The whole map snow covered. Why are the paths muddy brown and overlaid dark green trees like just give us no power path put little footprints oh there's just so many ways they could have made this more clear now thankfully it takes half a game maybe two games to internalize where the connections are and as long as you have someone at the table that knows where they are and can constantly like, oh no 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 that doesn't hook out uh it, it, it doesn't really hurt the gameplay but it is a disappointment yeah, I actually, uh, once I found them, what I found is, is just grab a pencil or something and, and mark them in so that you can mm -hmm. see where you have to get to uh, to do that. Now, sadly, yeah. they also didn't include the using red dice equals gold reference that they also left off the original sheet. There's still room for it on this sheet, and its absence continues to baffle me. Yeah, even on their Kickstarter page, it shows final sheets, and these aren't on the final sheets. So, I'm, I'm again, something went wrong there. Maybe these, hopefully, may, these will be things addressed. The game will be popular enough. It'll get a second printing, and they'll fix this. Yeah. Overall, everyone I played Dice Kingdoms of Valeria with who's used the winter expansion sheets has enjoyed them. A few of them, myself included, prefer them. That said, I don't feel these are a must-have. They don't fix the game. They don't make it that much better. They don't even add all that much variability to them. There's no real need to rush out and pick these up. Personally, what I would suggest is wait till you're about to burn out of the base game. Burn out on it. You're getting a little tired of it. Get something. Or if you're about to run out of sheets, 
instead of buying new copies of the original sheets or putting your game in the recycling bin, pick up a copy of this expansion. Actually, reprints of the new sheets in this expansion cost the same amount because you're getting 50 sheets or whatever, two times 50 sheets either way. It's just different enough to make things interesting and fresh again, and it's just going to give you just as much gameplay as you originally got. It's almost like buying a second copy of the same game and refreshing the whole thing. I agree. I actually enjoyed the winter sheets more once you get past those graphical hiccups, which are notable to get by. Uh, I can't even exactly place my finger on what the reason is. Mm -hmm. They just felt a bit better. Uh, And while that's not exactly helpful, it's interesting that I'm not the only one who has felt this. Yes. Now, if you really love the game and you're playing this week after week, maybe pick up a copy of Winter Expansion sooner rather than later because it'll help keep that engagement strong. And for those groups, I would I would pick up extra sheets of the base game, too, and then, you know, swap up what you use. Maybe one game use this and the next game use the other. Uh, maybe even go so far as to mix and match them and see how it turns out. Though, again, I still think every player should have the same thing. I really don't think this will work if someone uses this, whatever, spring, summer, original, I don't even know what they're called, and another player uses winter. Our winter scores have been significantly lower than our standard scores. Green and white for... <laughs> yes, green games. and white sheets. Definitely a great way to refresh the game if your original sheets are running low without risking having a whole new set just as your players get bored of it. Yeah, that's a good point. Now, if you thought Death Kingdoms was pretty cool but could use something a bit more, you might want to see if you want to try out a set of these sheets. They might just be that thing. There's like, like Sean said, you can't quite place what it is. It just feels better. So this might turn your game from good to great. Now, the print and play of the expansion is included with the main game. So when you buy that print and play, you do get both sheets. Now, while on the print and play, the art from the Miko isn't present, somewhat frustratingly, it is clearer to see the paths in this version. Yeah, you can kind of tell they kind of blocked out the graphic design, but for anyone who has vision issues, this is actually going to make the game more playable by using those files. Now, if you didn't really like Dice Kingdoms, especially if it was because of the randomness, these new sheets aren't going to fix the game. Due to the new road system, the game actually becomes more random than the original. Indeed, nothing from here will rescue it from your discard pile if you just didn't enjoy the original. Now, personally, I'm glad I got to check out both sets of sheets. Um, Kickstarter backers got the same thing. You got both right included in there. While I do prefer the winter sheets, just barely, I'm happy to play with either set. And now I just leave it up to whoever I'm playing with to decide what to use. Well, that brings us to the end of our review of the Dice Kingdoms of Valeria Winter Expansion. A couple of new sheets that keep things interesting while giving more of what you love about the original. What's an expansion you love for just giving you more of the same? Let us know about it in the comments. Or head over to discord.tabletopbellhop.com to talk about it with other Bellhop fans. Now, if you dig this review and the other content we create, I invite you to tip the Bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop or buy us a coffee at coffee.com, that's K-O hyphen F-I slash tabletopbellhop. I also invite you to check out my written review of this expansion on the blog. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since the last episode. So a lot of what I played in the last couple of weeks has been trying out expansions for games and prep for this episode. This includes Shadow Kings of Valeria with Rise of Titans, Roll Camera with B-Movie Expansion, the Winter Expansion for Dice Kings of Valeria, and actually the Special Factories for Azul, which we decided to skip out on because we thought we were going to go long as it was. Now, the only thing I think I want to add here is how fu- nice it felt playing the base game of Azul to the table because it's been a long time. I played enough of that and it's been long enough that it felt familiar and it was nice to sit down and play with having to review the rules. And yes, we added the expansion. Uh, we didn't do the full reveal so you didn't get to learn how they work, but they are super simple to use. So it didn't really feel like we changed it. And they were interesting enough. And I'm sure Dee's in the background muttering, I told you so to herself, as Mo points out that playing games you already know is indeed fun. And saves you money to go with something we just mentioned in the lobby. Now, I did get in some non-expansion gaming as well. Uh, this included a game night with Gwen and Deanna, where we got the Castle Panic Big Box to the table for the first time. So that one's off the pile of shame, but it's still on the pile of obligation. Now, we just played the base game of Castle Panic, hoping to master that before tossing in any of the expansions, which there are multiple of that come in that box. 
And for those who didn't see the unboxing, it is a big box. They didn't skimp on content. And I do have to thank Deanna for spending an evening with me, sorting through everything and trying to figure out where it goes in the insert. Pro tip, if you own this, look in your box lid. I completely missed it. The box lid shows you where everything goes. And I'm like, how did they not tell you where to put this? Googled it and saw someone going, isn't it cool that they put it in the box lid? And I'm like, oh, so I got to say, even then, it's still not totally clear. But but props to Fireside Games for showing you how to use their insert. There we go. Now, the game, it's Castle Panic. It hasn't really changed. The mechanics of the game, the number of monsters, the dice, it hasn't changed. This is this is the second edition of Castle Panic Big Box because there was an original edition. What they have done is they, there's a new board. It's bigger. Um, what I really like is the board has the reference information. So when just playing the base game, you won't need the rule book. Like all the, the four different boss monsters are indicated the turn orders indicated on there as are all of the special tiles that come out now i haven't gotten that far what i think is going to be frustrating is none of the expansion contents on the board but i get it this is a big box supposed to have everything and we were playing just with the base board so i do appreciate that um the new artwork is awesome um it just looks it's better artwork it's way more diverse which is great to see like any game i see someone a character that you can play that's in a wheelchair that just you don't see that yet and it's great to start seeing more of that. Um, as for the game, it, it's it's Castle Panic. It's a hugely random, pretty simple to teach game, open information co-op game. Your ability to win is probably going to be way more dependent on what comes out where and when than your own personal skill. But that's Castle Panic. And as long as you know that going in and you're willing to embrace that randomness, this can be a ton of fun. To me, this is an experience game. This is a, a get a big group around, possibly with drinks, get people like excited for the, oh, what did we get? Oh, did we do it? Oh, did you get the red card? Yes, we got there. You need that kind of atmosphere. This is that kind of game, not a puzzle to be solved. Well, now I feel like I should bring some drinks over if we're going to get that played this weekend. There we go. <laughs> Maybe we can do that. Well, we'll bring it out to Chapter 2 Brewery and, uh, and play a couple games. Now, Deanna didn't like it. Which isn't surprising because of the type of game she likes. Like her argument against it is we lost and we can't look back at what we did and point at anything we did wrong. But there was nowhere we're like, oh, remember that troll? Well, we should have did this instead. We probably could have played perfectly and lost. And she doesn't like that. Well, we are definitely more Euro style gamers who like to have that hands on involvement. So when the gods of randomness dis merely decree the loss, it can be frustrating. Yeah, I, I totally get it. But to me, that's just, it's Castle Panic. Like, like if you haven't played the game, you don't get it. I'm like, it, it's Castle Panic. Like, it, it, this is a different style of game than we usually play. This is the, 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 the uh, it's a different company. Like the Smirk and Dagger, the Smirk and Laughter, the, the, the kind of silly, very Ameritrash game, a randomness-based game. Now, I uh, was really hoping to get to play this with the barbershop bar crowd, with the, with the big group going, but I couldn't get anyone to play it, which I think this is an issue of the big box version of the game, particularly. It's scary. Here you have a very welcoming game, uh, a Marathrash at its finest, but you put it in this big box with six expansions and six promos and bonus cards, and, and people are just like, whoa, that looks complicated. I think the key is to set it up and have the box hidden away. Now, I would have done that, but we didn't have tables available. If I hadn't had downforce set up for a play to win, mm -hmm. I probably would have set this up. But we had a busy night with over 30 people. Yep. Now, speaking of downforce, the other game the Gwen and I played was downforce. Now, Gwen joined us for this, uh, this public play event and was planning on teaching games herself. So this was meant to be a refresher before the bar and a chance that Gwen can learn to play the game so that she could teach it if necessary. And we had a play to win table. So this was the first play for Gwen and she really enjoyed it. And it was funny because we got to the event and she's like, can I play downforce next? Like when we're done, next time you're going to play downforce, can I play? So she definitely enjoyed that one. It's such a solid game. And this is coming from someone who generally hates games with auctions. Uh, it still, it yeah. still does it for me. Yeah, uh, though I still, having taught it to a number of people, including a 10-year-old, 
Um, that auction part is rough. That is a, a tough hurdle the first game to get over. Now, speaking of the event, that was Saturday. This was our monthly board game night at the Barbershop Bar, co-hosted by the CG Realm. So it's a tabletop bellhop CG Realm joint venture. I was a busy night. Over 30 people at peak times. Lots of different game plays. Like, like I'm, I'm going to, this is, listen to this list. So you had Azul King's Garden, Hat Magic the Game, Drop It, Camel Up, Splendor, Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria with Rise of Titans, Pandemic, Exploding Kittens, Exploding Kittens, Exploding Kittens, like, like so much Exploding Kittens. It was like every gamer brought their copy of Exploding Kittens. Multiple games of Downforce, Monstrosity, Castles of Mad King, Ludwig, The Mind, Love Letter, Dungeon Mayhem, Calico, Catch the Moon, Point Salad, and probably more than I missed. Yeah, it was sad that I had to miss this one, both for the food, the people, and the game. Yeah, people-wise, too, we, we saw some people that moved back to Windsor I hadn't seen in years, so that was awesome. Though the Coney Dogs were messier than heck. It was <laughs> really messy. But he's got the po' boys now, so I'm torn on... Uh... I don't... It, uh, not this time. They did not. Oh, okay. No. Now, personally, I taught the game of Azul Queen's Garden, which, yeah, it's a rough teach. Everyone seemed to have fun. All players noted they wanted to play again now that they finally got out how everything worked, which does seem to be the thing with this game. But they didn't want to play now. <laughs> they were kind of like, can you bring this next week because we want to try again? Because my brain kind of hurts and I don't want to play it again now. Yeah, I can't see this game not requiring a teaching game before playing for real. Um, sadly, it's just got enough gotchas and things you need to watch out for and layouts that you just don't think of before actually playing and seeing the interaction of tiles on the board. Yeah, like I'm thinking the next time I have to teach it, I'm going to have to sit there and lay out a board and do a kind of summary of final scoring or something. I think that would help. Hey, Masmo, welcome. Thank you for the first time chat. I always like to call out new people. And I'm glad Eggman had a good time. I didn't realize who you were. So that's always <laughs> cool. Now, Drop It was a big hit, um, especially for the younger attendees. There was one very young girl. I didn't get an age, but like very young, for which it was the only game she played all night. Um, first, there was a team game with uh, the, 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 her and her brothers against mom and dad. And then she played over and over and over with her dad. So I got to say props to that dad for having the patience to play drop it over and over again. Not that it's a bad game. This has, I think, been the most played game across all of the events at this new location. Yeah. Uh, and still, I don't think they've managed to get a copy at CG Realm. So again, I th this might be Exploding Kittens because holy cow, there, there were so many games of Exploding Kittens. There were at least four different copies of the games. Um, one of those was Tech who was there with his kids, which was pretty cool. I did spend some time hanging out with them, and he finally got to play Go Cuckoo. Um, I also taught them the mind, which proved to be very popular. Uh, his kids were very much into the Exploding Kittens kind of fast card play, so that was kind of neat. Yeah, it's uh, it's. I'm glad that I didn't play it with Tech then, and then without you and, and ruin the chance for you to have that first time. There you time go. Yeah, him. he enjoyed it. We his, his kids only played the one round. I was trying to get him to play a second. Uh, most of the night, though, like I toasted. I, I, I was on my feet all night. I, I actually had a blister by the time I got home. I, I taught games. I talked to people about games. I recommended games. I answered rule questions. Watched over four rounds of Downforce. Um, at the end of the night, uh, Downforce did go home with Trevor. So congrats, Trevor, which was cool because he was new to the area. And this was the first public event they'd attended locally. Seemed to have a good time. I've seen they've already joined the Windsor Gaming Resource Group on Facebook. I look forward to seeing them out at future events. But well, certainly a nice way to be welcome to the local community. Yeah. Now, I know you noted this uh, last time you made it out, and we couldn't, that there were more kids there. And that trend seems to continue. I don't know how many were there specifically when you were there, but there were definitely some younger families. And there were some really young kids there that convinced me that I have to leave my copy of My Little Pony, the deck building game at home. Um, the girl who was playing Drop It when I first went over to try to recommend games was rocking around the barbershop bar, hugging my copy of My Little Pony, um, the, whatever it's, uh, Adventures in Equestria. I always forget I, it, the full it, name of that long, one. Long, long, long game. <laughs> yeah, now that the sun is up longer, people have seen other kids enjoying themselves at these events. I suspect we will continue 
to have a great all H's event uh, and the games needed, of course, we'll have to accommodate that uh, drop. It only goes for so goes for so, uh, yes. so long. Uh, we should probably get a copy of uh, uh, ghost hunters uh, uh, there. Maybe. Yeah, that one's uh, these kids were young enough. That would have been tough oh, okay. to that would have required coaching. Mm. Like, I'm almost wondering. I th- the problem is my kids have gotten rid of most of their like hobby games. Right. Or else I'd be looking towards those. Hamster so, roll. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Hamster roll. Yeah. Yeah. Gwen suggested hamster roll. So we'll probably be that. I did have rumble in the dungeon there. I figured that would be another one. Uh, except for the um, hidden rolls confuses young kids, at least with my kids. Yeah. That was that was confusing until they got to a certain age. Yep. King Domino. King Domino. Possible. Yeah. 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 That might be a good one. Like I have to look at it. Um, maybe even talk to Ian and see if they have anything at the store they could bring that's that's for the younger crowd or just relook around my room. Um, since it didn't get played at the event, I ended up bringing the My Little Pony deck building game to Brenda's on Sunday. Um, played a game with Brenda, Gwen, and I. We played three players. Um, as noted before, uh, the last time we talked about this, the iconography on the game is absolutely horribly small. And with Deanna's vision problems now is unplayable for her. Um, because this was the first time Gwen and Brenda had played, we used just the base rule, so we didn't throw the step backs in. Um, this did make things pretty easy to win. Uh, but I will say the big difference was having played it before, I could kind of tell you what you needed to do before it came up. So most importantly was realizing the game you played with me and Jen, that you need to get sugar cubes to overcome the hurdles. The, the, the thing you require to complete the steps of the game to finish it all require sugar cubes. And that's been confirmed. That's the thing you need to do. And the instructions don't really explain how important sugar cubes are. And and, and they're literally the key to winning the game. So it was nice knowing that so that I could tell people that, hey, a sugar cube generation card came up. You want to get that. Okay, we want to save up enough things to be able to go here because we'll get three sugar cubes. Focus on the sugar cubes and not just building your deck. Indeed, the game isn't exactly hard, but it fails to set expectations and that makes it feel hard yes. that first time. Yeah, we were like struggling the first game to figure out what we should be doing. And now that's a lot more clear. Well, I mean, when you when you add up the iconography issues, the small text issues, meaning you're having trouble reading all the different options you have combined with the lack of uh, that forecasting about mm-hmm. the sugar cubes it adds up to be a little overwhelming on that first play yeah totally fair now overall feelings were mixed at the end of the game Gwen liked it um what she really liked was that it was my little pony and and all the cards were stuff from the cartoon um she was a little disappointed that it was only the cartoon and not from the comics and she was also disappointed that it only covered up the season three so she knows her ponies um I, i'm assuming that's probably just living room for expansion content Now, Brenda, on the other hand, found the management of six resources along with the multi-use tokens and the unclear iconography to a bit much. She was actually struggling. I felt bad for her because we had to keep correcting her as she misunderstood or misused things. And like, yes, I'm playing with the kid's grandmother and people think grandmothers don't play games. Well, Dee's mom plays games. Yeah. She is a gamer as much as we are. She loves games. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. it was a bit much for her. and, And that's it. Is this game is meaty like it, it it is not a kid's game and it is not what you expect from the box and i, I was told this we we got heads up from sarah yep. that this was and i i still didn't believe it until i played it i guess yeah the iconography is frankly a huge detriment to that game and on its own just the iconography and sour my feelings about an otherwise really well designed and interesting game and i'm saying this about my little pony i was joking about like before we opened the box i was just ragging on this game i was being harsh uh and then we opened it and i realized oh no this has got this has got a game to it this is a hobby Mm -hmm. game that is brought down by some poor graphic design choices yeah and like i said dan i won't even try it at this point like like, there's no point even, like, even we with, just, we're just gonna have to walk her through what to do on her turn because even, even with the magnifying out. glass some of these icons did not work like, yeah <laughs> that's I, baffling yeah. um all right so that's it for what we've been playing let's take a look <laughs> at what we have coming up next so we finally got our first package from the mysterious package company 
we signed up to review a game from them months ago last year um might have been early last year and found out there was a serious printing issue and they told us to hold off now i fully expected to get like some kind of small box but they sent the whole thing again and yes this is the game box it, unfortunately it has my address very large on it which i haven't had time to scratch out but yes so this is the game box um so that showed up and i it, it was not like an updated component or, or anything this is an updated copy of the full game so i am looking forward to uh checking that out i'm gonna try to get an unboxing up possibly tomorrow so uh heads up i might be live tomorrow doing unboxings so there is that. Um, I am really looking forward to seeing this because Mysterious Package Company seems to be a step above all the other escape room in a box style things that are out there. So for fans of puzzle games, this might be a big one. I'm looking forward to diving into Siege of Valeria again. This is a solo game. Um, the the latest, it was the last of the small box Valeria games that we received from Daily Magic. I tried it once. I lost badly, but I think it was mainly because I'm just there, there was more going on than I expected and I wasn't paying enough attention. Um, plus, I'm hoping Sean will get a chance on it to, uh, to check it out. And I've got a box to open at the end of the show, which will probably fill up some of my time. Now, the other thing we're talking about is potentially having, it, it seems silly because he lives here, but a Sean con this weekend. So if we can get together, we're thinking of having Sean over for, for two days at least and just hammering a bunch of gameplays out as well as uh, indulging in some of the local delicacies and getting some great food. I've already lined up a couple meals just to try some new stuff. I haven't had a chance to try yet. Um, and maybe we'll get in the the the, the game of uh, Castle Panic with a, with a couple adult beverages at the end of the night. We'll see. Um, one of those is going to be Disney Sorcerer's Arena. So what we're going to do is just break open the other two expansions. We'll get our unboxings up this weekend uh, into next week. We'll get those up. And I think what we're just going to do is put all the characters out on the table, let people pick and choose and get to discover that and uh, possibly even include the kids in on that one. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, again, I, I'm, I'm familiar with all of the characters from the online version. Right. I'm really interested in seeing how they have converted that into the game because there's they've done they have done some things and they haven't done other things there's they're limited into as to what they can do and because of the the very strongly different game the uh, the mobile one it, it does and yet at the same time there are some uh some definite mm -hmm. uh, similarities between characters and styles yeah where i don't have that impact so you'll get to hear my thoughts just from I didn't even remember one of the characters was so <laughs> at least one, maybe two. I don't even remember now. Uh, the other one we have is we do have the latest Valeria game. I, I feel like we're becoming the daily magic show here, which we should probably try to get played this weekend, which is Castellans of Valeria. And like, just to show complication, this was the reference sheet. They had me print out because it's not clear in the rule book, which Sean, I think has a nice full color copy of, and this is the icon reference. So Yes, <laughs> we, we have the icon reference to just kind of show. I think this one's going to be a bit meatier yeah. than these small box games we've been reviewing. Yeah, this is not a small box game. That's for no, sure. It is not. And then while well, there's Castle Panic, uh, need, I, I've seen the base game enough. I don't like twice as like I'd played it before. I played the original Jamie's copy. What I am looking forward to checking out, though, is um, what the expansion adds, uh, which will hopefully include some more player agency. Now, I have heard from many hobby board gamers that the game becomes more of a gamer's game with each expansion so that's what i'm looking forward to i've i played the random kind of fun game that i'd play at the right you know beer and pretzel style event i'll happy play the the original game but i am hoping to find some depth to this game through the expansions well this show wouldn't be possible without our patreon patrons our vip guests so here's a quick shout out to five of them william fisher thank you Danielle and Owen Thomas, looking forward to hearing your thoughts on Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade. Sean P. Kelly. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Derek Hislin. Thanks, Derek. And Andrew Dacey. Thank you, Andrew. Well, that was the double bell. The new double bell. That the means our shift is coming to an end. It's time to lock the lobby doors. Though the doors are closed, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com. All over the web is tabletopbellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice as 
the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Before you get out the front doors, make sure you fill out our feedback form at the front desk by way of leaving us a review on the podcatcher of choice. More reviews we get, the more people who may discover our show for the first time. That's all for us tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us live. And be sure to stick around for the Penthouse Suite after show. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And And game game on. on.